So this Psalm, Psalm 23 verse 1 to 6 is a very familiar passage to all of us. And by the way, when we look at Psalm, there are two Hebrew words which I want to bring out. You may be wondering, I bring all the time Hebrew because I've been teaching Hebrew for more than 17 years. So that has become part of my study when I do the Bible study. Mizmor is one of the words used in Hebrew language, Mizmor. And that has come from the word Zamar. And the musicians will be very happy because the word Zamar means to pluck. That is used when, when you play the guitar, you pluck the string. And uh, so it means when you sing psalm, they used to sing psalm, they used to pluck the instruments so that they can play the string instruments. And there were, of course, a wind instrument and a, and a, a skin instrument and percussion instrument. Four types of instruments were there. One of them was the string instrument. So when you sing the psalm, it should be accompanied with music. That is what it is meant by the word mismor. Another title given for psalm in Hebrew is Tehilim. Tehilim. Later on when I get another opportunity, I'll go into the Hebrew word in detail. Tehilim is the word used for psalms in Hebrew Bible, which means praises. Praises. So psalms means to praise God. In other words, the 150 psalms, which is the Psalter, which is called as the book of psalms, or book of songs for the Hebrew people when they come to the temple to worship the Lord, is their song book. Like we have song books. So they, this is their song book actually. And they used to sing this. Even during Jesus' time, they used to sing this. Not read, but sing. So there is a tune behind it. And there is a music behind it. And you can see that on the head of each psalm that uh, the, the certain musical, you know, notations are given, you know, and in the Hebrew context. And then, then uh, who is supposed to sing to the choir master and all those details are given. And some wonderful singers who are there in the Old Testament like we have here, like uh, Sons of Korah, Asaf. Of course, David was one of the best musicians of that time. He's the one who... Uh, divided the entire group into 12 different choir teams so that they had 12 months so they can rotate it. All the Levitic, every get, everyone gets an opportunity. So 12 months, 12 choir teams. You can see that in the Chronicles. You can see that how it is divided. And David did that because he knew that there are a lot of Levites who are talented in that so they can be involved in singing. So, and... Because David was the king and also a, worship, a person who loved worship and who loved music. So we see the prominence of psalms in the worship from David's time onwards. Of course, there are some psalms which are written even before David wrote it. But some people say entire psalm is written by David. It is not so. Some people may say half of the psalms are written by David. It is not so. You know, there are... Some psalms were written by David, but because David was a well-known musician, the psalms, when you hear about psalms, you hear David. But there are other people also who have written and sung the psalms. So when you read, when you think about the psalms, we usually say song number one, psalm number two, okay, and verse number three. And But unknowingly, Sometimes we say Psalm chapter 1, Psalm chapter 2. So it is not so. It has to be said Psalm number 1 or 2. But we do that unknowingly. Even uh, some of the pastors do that unknowingly. So I, uh, that is one thing which I want, I have learned in my life. And so, uh, and another thing which I want to talk about Psalm is that this Psalm, entire Psalm is divided into, you know, into five books. You can see that in your Psalms, right? Psalm, book number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And each book has got certain number of Psalms. And then we also see that the Psalms is divided into various categories. Some are Psalm of uh, Thanksgiving, some are Psalms of, Psalm of Lament, some are Communal Psalms, some are Personal Psalms, and some are, you know, Impicatory Psalms. 
and some are you know uh, psalms which are written for royal purpose to be sung during the royal coronation and all there are so many things which i will come to that later on but i'm just giving you a general introduction so what uh, there are uh, uh, some psalms which are very familiar to us can somebody tell me which is the longest psalm i give the privilege to the children which is the longest psalm in the bible children only 119 which is the shortest again children older people can also join here shortest psalm 117 so good so you all passed so 117 is the shortest 119 is the longest can somebody tell me which is the pearl psalm pearl psalm moti bhajan 23 and so remember psalm 23 is understood by the scholars as the pearl song wow beautiful every single child of god who is raised in a sunday school setup is expected to learn psalm 23 whether they learn whether they get good marks in the school or not but they are expected to learn psalm 23 verse 1 isn't it there are two three verses we are by heart. we know john 316 psalm 231 another one jesus wept the shortest verse <laughs> all right so psalm 23 is very interesting and we all like that psalm and i want to talk about this psalm and i'll pick up only one verse from that verse number 1 but before i do that since it was the tabitha read the six verses i want to divide that psalm into four parts okay verse number 1 is the first one which talks about relationship with with the god with god writer's relationship with god verse 2 3 and 5 it talks about the deeds of his, of the shepherd what the shepherd has done for the sheep and then verse number 4 talks about the confidence of the sheep okay confidence of the sheep you also want to show the picture of a sheep and a shepherd if you have and verse number 6 is talking about the reward of following the shepherd if you follow this shepherd about whom we are going to talk about what are the rewards you're going to get by the way i will just focus on verse number 1 can we read it together once again psalm 23 1 the lord is my shepherd i shall not be i shall not want i shall not be in want or i shall lack nothing and somebody else said the lord is my shepherd i don't need anything that was another translation so beautiful way of uh, you know uh, translating verse number 1 we are going to study about the mystery or the secret of contentment look at the shepherd this is a modern shepherd i think It, uh, you know but the 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 arabic or hebrew shepherds they have a different kind of a dress and they are tending their sheep look at the different sheep and so here david is trying to talk about the mystery of the contentment in his life based on his experience we all know that before david became the king he was a shepherd and god like this kind of a profession i am not asking you to join this profession but all the leaders in the old testament days mostly those leaders who are used tremendously were once upon a time shepherds look at abraham look at isaac jacob look at moses look at uh, david you know and amos the sh- he was another sh- uh, prophet so all these were shepherd once upon a time because once you deal with the sheep you will learn so many things you will have to unlearn certain things and then you will have to learn certain things the most stupid or you can say i don't want to use the word stupid the most unintelligent animal is the sheep although we like lamb and goat and all <laughs> but the intelligence level is very low very low and you can imagine god has given you know his leaders his people to sh- lead this kind of animal imagine you lead sheep for 5 days you will either have your blood pressure you know high blood pressure or some other problems anxiety level because that's a kind of thing but god want to teach 
patience. That is one reason God sent Moses into wilderness. He could have given him some other things to do, but God told Moses, go and tend your father-in-law's sheep. He didn't tell him, but he got that opportunity through God, I believe. Forty years he learned how to tend the sheep. And then he became so patient, so patient, that God testified about Moses and said, I don't see anybody like Moses who is the meekest, who is like, meek like Moses. Of course, Jesus you cannot compare with. But then Moses, among the human beings, he was the meekest. This tending of sheep made him so. You take care of your children for two days, one week, ask the parents. You are also shepherding your children, right? And how much of patience you learn after shepherding your children. Imagine you are shepherding the Sunday school children. <laughs> ask the coordinators of the teens group. Ask the youth group leaders when they tend, the, they take care of, when they coordinate. Ask the area coordinators when they are coordinating their, you know, Bible study groups. How much of patience they need, you know. And I talk to them and I know what all things they go through. And imagine a pastor's life. <laughs> so that is it. God wants us to be a shepherd. And David was a shepherd and he knew what a shepherd, who a shepherd is and what are the qualities of a shepherd and what all things he can learn from shepherd. And he's trying to compare himself with, the, with a sheep. And he's comparing his God with that of a shepherd. So he's trying to bring that relationship in this particular psalm. Shall we look into that? The mystery and secret of contentment. So we are going to look at the what of the relationship, the why of the relationship, and the purpose of relationship. What is the relationship? The relationship of a shepherd and sheep. Why so? Because he was a shepherd. So he wanted to bring that. And now we are going to look at the purpose of relationship. Number one, the benefit of relationship. This kind of relationship between a sheep and a shepherd. By the way, have you ever seen a shepherd moving with the sheep? We have seen that. And some of you might have seen that. No? With 500, 1,000 sheep and cattle, they go from one place to other. In Jammu Kashmir, during the summers, the shepherds, uh, they are called as, uh, you know, gujars and bakarwals in our place. They have hundreds of sheep, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000. So they move from, from Kashmir to Punjab during summertime. Sorry, during the winter time. So it is very cold in Kashmir. So they move from that place to, to the plain area. And during the winters, uh, during the summers, they move from Punjab back to Kashmir because it is very hot in, the, in Punjab area. So they move towards. So we can see that from our church building. We stay near the national highway. And, uh, you know, mornings and evenings during certain time of the month, uh, year, we can hear these shepherds whistling and you can see the sheep moving. Uh, we used to go out and stand and see how they are moving and, uh, you know, in a, in, in a group they move and they have shepherd dogs around them and the shepherds are going in front of them, at the back of them, the entire family is with them and it is amazing to see their life, you know, it is amazing. So that is why... There is a certain kind of connection between these shepherd and sheep. We may not know them by name, but each shepherd knows their sheep by name. There was a shepherd near living uh, uh, next to us. He had only 10 or 12 sheep, okay, sheep or goat. So every day morning he used to call his sheep and say, Gumlu, Shumlu, Golu, Molu. And I said, what is he doing? And actually he was calling out the name and the Gumlu would come and then the Golu would come and the Molu would come. And I was wondering that then he knows who is Gumlu, who is Molu, right? So our God is also like that. He knows you by name. Interesting thing. That is the thing which David is trying to bring out and he is saying that when I walk with this shepherd, one of the benefits, he has so many benefits, but one benefit which you see in verse number one, what is that? A sense of satisfaction. Sen sense of contentment. Everybody say contentment. So, in this world, people are not content. When I say content, it is to, it is to do with the material things, things of this world. If, if somebody got a job, he wants another job. And another job, he, gets, he has some uh, 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 thing he gets in his life, he wants another thing. So, that is the 
nature of man. They want to get more and more and more. There are very few people who would say, no, no, I'm happy with whatever I have. Okay, because God has given me the ability to, you know, survive. That is what. But, of course, we should be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, adventurous. We should be uh, optimistic. We should be, you know, I am just not getting that word, you know, always ambitious. Yeah, a, a positive ambition, ambition should be there. I am not against that. But here, there are some people, even after getting all the blessings from God, they are still like the people of Israel, murmuring. They're thinking about the bhindi, tomato, you know, that melons and all those things they got in Egypt. They are given freely the manna daily, three times manna, I mean, one time they get it, and then water, fresh water, the most purest form of water, and AC day and night, morning the shade of cloud, you know, cloud of, pillar of cloud, and evening you have the pillar of fire. So 24 hours for 40 years, God did not build them. They didn't have to pay anything. But still, they were not content. So the result was that none of them entered the land of Canaan, except for Joshua and Caleb, who started from Egypt. So contentment is one of the most important things one should be having in his or her life. Discontentment for spiritual things should be there. We should be discontent only about the spirit. Lord, I need more of you. That is, a, that is what I'm talking about. When we have the discontentment for the spiritual things, that will lead to the real contentment. Hallelujah. If I have you, I don't want anything else. That was Swami said. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, should, I don't lack anything. And, uh, you know, Mark, making Yahweh as the shepherd makes you content. I'm coming to that. So, the sense of Contentment is one of the most important benefits which David is trying to tell us that he has got after following this shepherd. My sheep follow me and they are content. Because when the enemy comes, when the bear came, when the lion came, they were protected because they followed me. I am a good shepherd. And I have a better shepherd than I am. So he is there, the Lord, God himself. As long as he is there, I am content. Whether my mother and father forsake me, I don't, I, I have, I, 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 I'm sad, but I'm not discontent because I have one God who cares for me. Even though, even though I'm a sh shepherd in the jungle, even though I'm the king of Israel, that doesn't matter. What matters is whether I have Yahweh as my shepherd or not. Hallelujah. That is the most important thing. All these things in this world are good, that matters. But the most important thing is whether I have somebody whom I can count on. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd. Everybody say good shepherd. Okay, let me move to the second most important thing. And that is uh, the sense, the source of contentment. Who is the source of contentment for, for David? And by the way, you know Psalm 23 is written by David. I didn't mention that, but you knew it, so I didn't talk about it. The source of contentment is four let Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, and that is Yahweh. In Hebrew language, they don't write the vowels for the name, for, for that name, because they don't know the vowels. They don't know how to pronounce it. They just know it is Y-H-W-H. H. And that is based on Exodus chapter 13, 3 verse 13 and 14. Exodus 3, 13 and 14, when God is giving his, I mean, uh, when Moses is asking for the explanation about his name, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to Israel, children of Israel, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he, said to, and he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, look at that capital, I am, we are going to focus on that, has sent me to you. Okay, so the Hebrew word used there is Ichwe Asher Ichwe. Okay, just remember Ichwe, Y-H-W-H, -H. just remember that. So the name, number one, the, the most important thing, the source is Yahweh. He understood that I am content because I have a source and that is none other than Yahweh. 
You see that? David is using the, the name of God. And I'm telling you, nobody usually uses the name of God. You know, in our Eastern context, we don't call our, our elders by name, right? We either call uncle or auntie or, you know, Achayan or Amama, Chatan, Chatin, whatever, you know, Dada or, you know, whatever in our languages, Bhaiya or Bhabi. We don't call them by name unless we are in a different culture, right? So some people call them by name. That's okay. But this is an Eastern context. And here God is God and they don't want to call him by name. Even though God explained to them his name, none of the Israelites, even till today, know how to pronounce it. Such a holy name it is. Because one of the Ten Commandments says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. So they don't pronounce it. When that name comes, they'll keep quiet. And then they go to the next word. When they are writing the name, as you all know, when they are writing uh, any statement, if the name comes in between, they'll change the pen or the nib of the pen or the, even the ink of the pen and write it with a new pen because they consider that as very holy. So why, with the, in that context, why David is using that particular name there? Instead of that, he could have said Elohim, God. He could have said some other titles for God. But why he is using the name? Because names determine the personality of a person. Now let me tell you one thing. This name was given to the least, uh, you know, in the least powerful nation in the world. It was not a nation at all. Israel was not a nation as long as they were in Egypt. They were called as slaves. But you know whom did God reveal this name for the first time to? To these slaves. Are you getting the point? When there was the most powerful nation, Egypt, Pharaoh sitting there, God did not reveal that to them. But God was pleased to reveal his personal name to the least in the world. That was a revelation I got when I was coming from San Jose. Praise God, Lord, you consider us and you want to reveal your great mystery to people who are the least in this world. And in Corinthians, Paul says that God has chosen the weak of this world, the least of this world, the foolish of this world. And that is why we are thankful to God that God has opened our spiritual eyes. There are smarter people. They are better people in this world. They, they are in all respect. They are the very topmost people in this world. But look at yourself. Look at myself. God has chosen you. There were so many relatives whom God could have revealed. But God was pleased to reveal his secret to you and me. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. That revelation was given and our eyes are opened. I was wondering, Lord, many of my relatives are not yet in faith. You have chosen me. What a love God has shown towards us. And I want to thank God for that. And then another thing is the personal name of God was given, not the title. There is power in the name. You know, if you say that, okay, the president of America is coming. There is power behind. Once he is, he, I mean, he is not in that post anymore. People will not bother about him. He's there. Whoever is there, whether prime minister or president, because of the title, once they are moved from that position, people might say, okay, he was, but they won't respect him. He will not have that power. Name doesn't have that power, but title has power. But in this case, even though there is no title given there, the name itself has power. The name of Jesus is above every other name. That is why David is saying, Yehovah! Yahweh is my shepherd. What a fantastic thing. You know, I was thinking about it and I have actually got this uh, uh, meaning several years back, but I want to give it to all of us if you have not understood. The word Yahweh has come from, the, from Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 where it is written, Yahweh asher Yahweh. What does it mean? I am what I am. By the way, that is in Hebrew, and that Hebrew phrase can be translated in three tenses in our English language. I was what I was. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. 
It means that the name of God is not limited by time. To make it more simple, God is telling to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, go and tell those people, I was the God of, I was there when their fathers, grandfathers, great, grand, great, great grandfathers were there. I was there then. I am there now. I will be there when you are gone, your grand, 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 grandson will be gone. <laughs> that means he was there, he is here, and he will be there. He will be there 24 hours, 365 days, all throughout the ages. He is from eternity to eternity. Can you define God? Can you define God? We are here in this world for 80, 90 years or 100 years. And we are thinking, worried about so many things. My God is saying, I was with, there with your grandfather and I am with you and I, I know your future, where you are heading towards. You may not know your future. You don't know who you are, but my God knows you more than what you know about yourself. Hallelujah. For example, you may be thinking about children's schoolings and education. Some of you may be thinking about your life partner. Some of you may be thinking about so many things. You do not know. You're not sure about it. You may have some ideas, but not sure. But my God knows the name of your future college, your life partner. Even before Milan was born, you know, they did not know how Milan looked like. Of course, they named him. They were struggling with the name and all. But my God knew about Milan long, long, long back. You agree with that, leader? Parents did not know. They, she was carrying for nine months. But my God knew him long back. And he knows about his future. What a great God. He's not limited by time. You can call him any time. Day time, night time. Any time. Not limited by God. And that is why David says, I am content. Because he's a timeless God. He cannot be bound by time. That's the meaning of Yahweh. Another meaning is, this name was given in the context of liberation. Liberation. When the people of Israel were now was going through suffering and Pharaoh would not let them go. And that is when God said, Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 to 10, you can read that later on. He said, God said, I have seen their misery. I have heard their cry. I am concerned about them. So I am coming down. And this is my name. It means, whenever this name is used, understand you should use the synonym liberation. There is a liberation going to happen. There is a change that is going to happen. He is not just simply Yahweh coming. He comes, there is some deliverance going to happen. Either physical or emotional or financial or any other area of your life you think. If Yahweh is coming, something will happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is why this name was used even in the New Testament. Jesus, Jesus, when he made some statements, what did he say? I am. In the Old Testament, God said, I am. Capital I am. He's the same I am who's standing there. Standing on the water. Walking on the water. The, 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 the disciples are worried and concerned. And they were worried, who is this? Is? And Jesus said, I am. This I. I am walking on the water. So my point, what I'm trying to tell you is, whenever Jesus' name is pronounced, there is deliverance. The name Hallelujah has got Yahweh in it, right? Hallel plus, Hallelu plus Yah, Yah is Yahweh. So don't just simply say Hallelujah. When you, whenever you are saying Hallelujah, expect a deliverance happening. I'm, are, you, are you serious about it? Are, did you get the point? Whenever you say hallelujah, some deliverance is happening in your family, in your church, in your workplace. You know, it's a, it's a funny story, but let me tell you. Several years back, maybe 80 years back, there was a preacher, I don't remember exactly his name, and he was uh, preaching. Uh, yeah, not 80 years back. That's another story. This is another story, maybe 50, 20 years back, yeah. He went to a remote village in Calcutta. Uh, I mean, in the, not Calcutta, but uh, in the West Bengal area, Nagarkata, sorry. So, 
he was there as an evangelist he did not know the language of that place but only thing he knew was god had called him for that place and uh, he did not know how to survive in that forest area he only knew he wanted to share the gospel and wanted to redeem the people every day he would pray for them and people would not understand his language he they would not understand his language he would not understand their language he would show some actions and uh, pray and say hallelujah hallelujah that's all they learned and one day you know in the evening or so there was some kind of commotion people are running here and there all these people who are living in the forest they start running and he did not know what to do and then somebody said elephant elephant in their language and they all ran and got onto the top of the tree because that's how they escaped you know when the when a elephant this poor pastor he was from kerala he did not know how to do <laughs> he did not know how to climb the tree and he sat standing there and the and the wild elephant was right in front of him what can you do when the wild elephant is there either submit <laughs> or run there's no way he can run because the el- wild elephants are very ferocious and that is when the lord reminded him the power of hallelujah the name of jesus the name of yahova and all the all those tribal people were looking looking at him from the from the tree top and he was standing there closing his eyes elephant is right in front of him and he prayed a simple prayer lord i am yours and this elephant also belongs to you what shall i pray and god said close your eyes and shout hallelujah and he closed his eyes and shouted on top of his voice hallelujah and then he opened his eyes the elephant was gone this is first time in the history of that place those tribal people came down and they bowed down before him thinking he's a god they said what a miracle man we have been here in this forest for several years but we didn't succeed this man said something like hallelujah and something happened ever since they started calling him hallelujah pastor they can't even pronounce is not because of the ability of the pastor because of the power in the name of yahweh hallelujah the name yahweh has power in it and that is why david says that i am content even though enemy comes against me i will be victorious i will be content because god's name is with me because when he looked at goliath he said you come against with the javelin and all kinds of equipments i don't have any of the equipments i am not trained but i have one thing in with me that is the name of yahweh come against you and then he you know threw the stone at him and you see the rest of it goliath was down the name of god has got power in it so whenever name of yahweh is used you will see a deliverance or else you can use that this week and try and see that children you can try the name of jesus and you will see deliverance happening okay let me move to the third most important thing that is the reason for the contentment the reason for the contentment is he is considering yahweh as shepherd in the ancient days the shepherd was used the pictorial pictographic language was used for shepherd and that was the head of a man and with the eye you know i uh, which was seen in the picture it means that somebody is watching over you that's the meaning of shepherd let me look at the hebrew word you know the hebrew word for uh, shepherd that is roi so psalm 23 verse 1 is yehova roi not that roi we have this is roi r o e i that's how it is pronounced and roi is very interesting this word roi has come can come from has come from two hebrew words i was just meditating over it one of the words for the word roi roi means shepherd has come from the word ra r a a ra means the one who watches over you who keeps looking at you let me show you the example of a mother watching over her baby i know we have an infant baby there and also another one shown there 
you know, all, all the other children are grown up. Even then, I know the mother's heart. They'll be all the time trying to look at the baby. They always want to see what is happening there. So this is different. And that is a picture of, now mothers may fall asleep. They doze off, right? But my God neither sleeps nor slumbers. That is why Hagar, for the first time, gave the new title to God as Yehovah Roy, El Roy, Lord who sees me. My master couldn't understand me. My, my, my mistress couldn't understand me. But this God came to this wilderness and he looked at my condition. And that is why she called him Yehovah Roy. My friends, I want to tell you, when David is using the word, the Lord is my shepherd, Yehovah Roy, he is saying that he always looks at me. Even though I was born as the eighth child in the Jesse's family, and some people even say that David was born in a different context, which I'm not getting into debate and all, but he was considered as an unwanted person in one way or other way. All the seven were in good shape. This guy was sent to the to the jungle. And he was the youngest among them. I was thinking, why did his father send him? Because he was not that strong as the other brothers. But he says, even in the forest, my God is always looking over you. Children, I'm telling you, your parents are always watching over you. But more than that, your God is always watching over you. If you consider him as your shepherd. David considered it. And he was, while he was outside, while he was in the, in the forest, while he was standing, can you imagine he's standing right before Goliath? Goliath. Saul is sitting there. His elder brothers, all the officers are sitting there. 40 days fasting, not eating anything because of fear of Goliath. <laughs> not because they have committed, but because of fear of Goliath, they are fasting. Some people are fearful, that's why they fast. But now, this, these guys are sitting there. And David is standing there without any covering. Without any soldiers, you know, what is that, protection or nothing like that. Saul tried to give him. He said, if I wear that, I will not be able to walk. You know, this is very heavy for me. He knows I have another covering. And there is one person who is watching over me. And this Goliath looking at him and said, am I a dog that you come to me with stones and sticks? See this, he also kind of humiliated him. He did not know the secret. Goliath, there may be some Goliaths in your life who is trying to, you know, you know come and uh, destroy you and uh, take uh, control over your life. But remember one thing, even though there are Goliaths, even though there are certain situations, my God is always watching. He's always watching. That very moment when you say, Lord, I'm drowning, he will be there. Peter was drowning and Jesus was right there. Hallelujah. That's the kind of God we, we serve. That's why David was content. And another meaning which I want to bring out and stop, that is Roy also has come from another word, Ra, R-A-A-H, which means friend. Beautiful, isn't it? Shepherd means the one who watches over you. Shepherd also means a friend or a companion. Somebody said it's like a brother or a husband to his wife. You know, a fellow man, a companion who is always with you. What a beautiful term, name it is. That he is your shepherd, he is your friend. Who is your friend with whom you can share your heart with? You cannot share everything with everybody, right? You may have so many people. You know, even the church, you may not be able to share everything with everybody, but there will be somebody with whom you can pour out your heart. But even then you are with the reluctance saying, no, no, this much I can share, not all, not all. But here is a God who comes to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and says, how can I destroy Sodom and Gomorrah without informing, you now later on we see, my friend, Abraham. Look at the relationship, the friendly relationship. What a friend we have in Jesus. This afternoon, I want to encourage you. Time has run out. I want to tell you one thing that if you think that 
God is your shepherd, he wants to be your friend. He wants to be with you all the time, not just Sundays, not just special meetings, not just retreat time, not just when you are praying, but he wants to be with you 24-7. That is why his name is, the, 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 his name is Parakletos, no, the companion Holy Spirit, walking with you, talking with you. If he is your friend, I want to challenge you one thing. This week, I want you to talk to him uh, anytime he wants you to talk to you. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? He is available. He is available. But are we available? If we don't have that kind of intimacy, there is something wrong. David had that intimacy of that of a friend. When I am praying, I am praying as if I am talking to my friend. He is my God. He is my creator. But he is also my friend. Tabitha, who is your friend? You have a friend? Jesus is your friend. More than your daddy, mommy. No, more than Bethany. More than anybody else. Eh? Joel, who is your friend? Yeah? I'm asking children because, you know, Elsa, who is your friend? You know? Joel, there, who is your friend? Joshua, he has Joshua. <laughs> At least he has somebody to say. <laughs> but I'm asking each one of us, do we have a friend? Like he has Joshua. We have somebody whom we can rely on. You can share your problems. You can tell all what is there in your heart. Let's close our eyes.